number two tonight. As we pick up from where we left off last week, we're dealing with chapter two, the first nine verses. And our topic of beware of counterfeits. Beware of counterfeits. As Peter, his theme for the book is found in chapter one, verse three. All things that pertain to life and godliness. And of course, that's our, our title of our series on Second Peter. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And here in chapter 2, he begins to warn us about false teachers. As he has wound, wound up chapter 1 dealing with the inspiration of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, that Scripture is our, our foundation, if you will, of the Christian life. As important as that is, chapter 2, therefore beware of counterfeits. Because the devil wants to present us with counterfeits. We mentioned that last week about a counterfeit Christians, a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit uh, righteousness, and one day he will present a counterfeit Christ. He will be that brazen. We need to beware of counterfeits. If you have a Bible there, follow along with me. Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. That's referencing that but back to the inspiration of Scripture. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, or bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow the pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their, damnable, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that uh, should after live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, vexed with the right, filthy combination, or conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelleth among them, in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, to be punished. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you tonight praying that you would meet with us now. Lord, I pray that you would be with our services. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in all that's said and done. Lord, I pray tonight that you would give me clarity of thought, clarity of speech. Lord, may I tonight present your word as you would have it. Lord, as we try to expound the word of God, Lord, maybe we take it to heart where there are many counterfeits. Lord, help us to be discerning. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to the word of God. We love you, we thank you, we praise and honor and glory, for you're worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Last week as we started our, this section, we talked about counterfeits. And in order to spot a counterfeit, you have to know what the original, what the true is like. That's why it's important for us, as Peter starts ch chapter number 2, he's falling on the heels of the inspiration of God, the inspiration of Scripture, how the holy men of God of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That was tremendous in chapter 2, but understand, there were false prophets. There, there, there was the true word of God, thus saith the Lord. Those were the, the true prophets, but remember at the same time, there were the false prophets. Those who, in the name of God, really preached damnation to their own souls. So he's reminding us of the, the tremendous gift, the exceeding great and precious promises we have in the word of God. With that, but remember, be careful. There are counterfeits. That's why it's important that we know the Word of God. If we don't know the Word of God, we will fall for every counterfeit the devil throws out there. We have to be able to detect a false teacher, a false doctrine. In this passage of Scripture, we see that there's three aspects of false teachers that Peter's going to bring to our attention. Three aspects. Last week, we began looking at verses 1, 2, and 3, dealing with their description. Their description. We said, first of all, we noted their deception. The deception of their message in, in verse uh, number one there. Um, their damnable heresies, their destructive. Even uh, we saw their, their 
their methods, they come in privily under false pretenses. They were feigned words, plastic words, twisting of words. We have to be careful because many times, many, many, many times, people will use the same words we use, but define them differently. And if you're not careful, you'll fall for what they're preaching. Fall for what they're teaching because they use the same words, but they just change the definition. They say, oh yeah, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. Oh, that's great. They use the same word, but they don't mean the same thing. They just believe it's, the Bible contains the Word of God. It's, you know, parts of it are, part of it isn't. And they're the ones inspired to figure out which parts are and aren't. So they, they'll use the same words, but have different definitions. They have plastic words, feigned words. Then we talked about as their description, not only their deception, but their denial. The key to understanding who a false teacher is comes down to two basic questions. What do they say about Christ? And what do they say about the work of Christ? Okay, who is he? Is he the son of God? Or is he a God? Has he always been God? Or did he become God? So those are key issues. And what about his work? Was his work on, cross, on the cross of Calvary, was it simply an example? Or was it sufficient for the salvation of all? Those, those are major issues. And when it comes down to those, that's how you determine a false teacher and a true teacher. Um, last week, we took some, a few minutes to look at a transcript of a false teacher. And I make no bones about calling his name. His name was Joel Osteen. He does not believe Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. According to the word of God, 1 John chapter number 4, he is a false teacher. Okay? Now, I'll tell you, he, he tried to clarify that a few months later, talking to one of his favorite people, Oprah, who's in the same boat he is, a pantheist, who believes there's multiple ways to God. And he said, oh, well, let me clarify. I believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's just many ways to Jesus. You basically said the same thing. There's many, what does that mean? There's many ways to Jesus. No, Jesus is the way. There's not many ways. It's by grace through faith. And it's in Jesus. Period. Know what the word of God says so you can identify a counterfeit. So there's their deception. There's their denial. Then we talked about verse 2. This is kind of where we left off their sensuality. We talked about uh, their motive. Verse number 2. They're pernicious ways. That means it's being, their, their ways are destructive. They are perishing. Um, Jude, verse number 4, talks about they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. It's a license to behave any way you see fit. And you'll find that's, that's really what a lot of false teachers will have in common. Now, there'll be some who are on the other side, and they're very strict. But the basis of their rules and regulations is what they say. Then there's others, like the person I just mentioned, oh, it's okay, you live life the way you want to. You don't have to live like your mom and dad. You don't have to live all separated. You don't have to live like the Word of God says, because God loves everybody, and he wants everybody to have a lot of money, especially me. So send me your dollars, and I'll send you a handkerchief. Now, we laugh, but it's happened, hasn't it? You know, you call in and we'll pray for you. And if you make a donation, we'll pray even harder for you. No, that's, that's in Scripture. We can see it making merchandise of you. Okay? They have sensual motives, not spiritual motives. When I say sensual, I'm talking about fleshly, not spiritual. In fact, if you will, um, notice, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, their sensuality, their motive is to fulfill their own lust, their own fleshly desires. And then last week, we kind of wrapped up talking about their followers. I went very quickly through their followers. We talked about their sensuality. Their sensuality saw their motive, now their followers. Look at verse number two. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Notice, the Bible tells us very clearly False teachers will gather a very large audience. You know why? Because we're human and we're drawn to the sensual, not the spiritual. We have fleshly desires too. We like being told. 
you can do what you want to. Do what makes you feel good. Who doesn't like that message? But Titus chapter 2, verses 10, 11, and 12, you know, tell us you know, that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. Teaches us to live soberly, to live righteously. That's what grace teaches. But Jude, once again, verse 4, talks about they've taken the grace of God and turned it into lasciviousness, that license, that conduct to do whatever you want, to feel however you please. Now notice, we mentioned this last week, audience does not equate to authenticity. Tell with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. But preacher, they have millions and millions of people listening and watching and giving, and they're leading millions and millions to hell. That, that's the bottom line. But notice this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to heaven. Yeah. Is that what it says? It leads to where? Destruction. Because their way, remember the ways are pernicious. That word pernicious means destructive. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. How straight is it? There's only one way. I am the way, Jesus said. So just because they have a large audience doesn't mean they're real. Doesn't mean they're authentic. Doesn't mean they're true. The Bible warns us false teachers will have large followings because people are drawn to fulfilling their own sensual fleshly desires. And having some man of God authenticate that for you, give you a stamp of approval, and make you feel good about it, the Bible talks about that as well. That in the last days they shall teach themselves, teachers having itching ears, telling them what they want to hear. Look at verse, same chapter, Matthew 7, look down at verse 21. Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Oh, but they talk about Jesus, and they talk about God. Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have I not done many wonderful names? I never knew you. You were a worker of iniquity. And all those people that followed you, that followed you in your pernicious ways, in your destructive ways, I never knew you. So their followers, we see their, their sensuality, and their sensuality, their motive, their followers. But then also notice, this is the saddest part, I believe, of all, is the followers' fate. Verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious, their destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. In the verse number 3, and their damnation slumbereth not. Where will their followers end up? The same place they're going to end up. The millions that follow them, believing the whole time that they're going to go to heaven will wake up one day and torment their followers. Look with me at Titus, chapter number 1. Titus 1, look with me at verse number 16. Titus 1, 16. They profess... That they know God. How many people do you, do you know that fall into that category? They profess they know God. Read the rest of the verse though. But in works. 
they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. You see, the profession and the life should be consistent. If you believe in God, then there's only one way of salvation. If you believe in God, the Bible is true. Not what you feel is true. Look with me at Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 24. Romans 2, 24. The Bible says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The follower's fate is the same as that of the false teacher. God will give them up to their own reprobate minds. Notice as we continue the description of the false prophets, we see their deception, we see their denial, we see their sensuality. Then verse number 3, we see their greed. Their greed. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, those plastic words, once again, make merchandise of you. They shall make merchandise of you. The Greek word there deals with the idea of a peddler who comes through town buying and selling. Why is he always moving through town? Why does he always leave one town and go to the next? Why don't you just stay here? He's got good business. You don't, they don't want to know where, exactly. They don't want you to know where to find them. They're making merchandise of you. That's once again their sensuality, their fleshly desires coming out, their covetousness. It's amazing to me how they'll preach. God doesn't want anybody to be poor. Why don't you give part of your 40 million to somebody who needs it? Is, is, isn't 39 million good enough for you? Why don't you give a million away? No, 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 not going to do that. Their covetousness, making merchandise of you. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse 5. There's what, what Paul says of himself to the church of Thessalonica. He says, For neither at any time used we, that's Paul and his team, for neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. That's a true teacher. It's a characteristic of a true teacher. What are these false teachers doing? They're using religion as a cloak of righteousness. So they take religion and clothe themselves in it to look good, but only that coat of religion, guess what they are? They're covetous sinners, feeding their own fleshly desires. Look at me at Micah. I'll give you a head start. Micah chapter 3, one of them little Old Testament books. That's Genesis, Exodus, Micah. There's a few books, books in there in the middle, but yeah. It's after Genesis. It's a big help, isn't it? If you've got a Schofield, old Schofield, it's page 950. Actually, no, I'm sorry. That's Micah, but that's not the page we need. 947. That'll help you. 947 if you have a Schofield. Micah chapter 3, verse number 11. Notice this. The heads thereof judge for reward. What does that mean? What is the judge doing? He, he's getting paid. Whoever had the most money won the court case. Okay? The heads thereof judge for reward. And then notice, and the priests. You're supposed to be the men of God. And the, and the priests thereof teach for hire. And the prophets thereof, divine for money. Yet where they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. This is the condition of Israel at this time. Notice the legal authority. Then there's the priest and the prophet. 
the religious authorities, they were doing the same thing. Telling people what they wanted to hear as long as they had enough money. As long as they were living okay. You know, if the offering was good that Sunday, it was a peace on earth method, message. If the offering wasn't, wasn't good, it was hell on earth. Damnation. Hell, fire, and brimstone. Take another offering. You, you understand? They were preaching for money. They were prophesying for money. And at the same time saying, oh, it's okay, it's all of God. God's going to protect us. Look at verse, 11, verse 12. God responds, Therefore shall Zion for your sake, now remember Zion is Jerusalem, be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountains of the house as the high places of the forest. Oh, it's all good. It's great. God's blessing us. Uh-uh. God says, no. You love this place, don't you? I'm telling you, because of your sin, they're going to use it for, for fields. They're going to plow it, because they're going to lock everything down. It's going to be flat, flat land. God doesn't take kindly when we mess with his word. It will not go unpunished. So these false teachers use religion as a cloak of covetousness. Because of that, we understand Luke chapter 10, verse number 7. Actually, going back up to verse number 2, we'll start there. Understanding, understanding the prevalence of false teachers, understanding the great following that they may have. With that in mind, this passage in Luke chapter 10 the Lord is sending out 70 disciples and by two uh, on the first mission's journey, if you will. Verse number two, he says to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Verse 7. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking, such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Why is the laborer worthy of his hire? The true teacher, the true work, the true minister of God, the true man of God is rare compared to false teachers. False teachers are very prevalent. But the man who will stand up, live for God, preach the word of God is precious. And he reminds them, listen, the laborer is worthy of his hire. If he stands up and tells you, thus saith the Lord, and it's thus saith the Lord, man, that's precious. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Why, why is that? Well, because his motives are pure. His motives are pure. Note with me, um, back in Second Peter, chapter number 2, skip down to verse number 18. Speaking once again of the false teachers. For when they, that's the false teachers. Second Peter 2, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure to the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Notice what kind of words do they speak? Great swelling words of vanity. Yes, I know you out there in TV land. You're watching today and you're hurting. And, and your bank account is dry. And you don't know where your next paycheck's going to come from. Man, you're, just lay your hand on the TV. I'm going to pray for you right now. And be sure when that check comes in, send me half. <laughs> What's TV? <laughs> Have you not heard those things? Great swelling words. Great promises. Oh, if you'll just send in your seed, your seed offering. And the check's in the mail. Yeah, yours to him. Great swelling words. You're hurting, and I can fix it. Uh, you're hurting. Send me some as uh, your seed offering, and God will take care of it. Great swelling words. 
telling people what they want to hear. False teachers are not ministers. According to our verse in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, false teachers are merchandisers, not ministers. Turn to the book of Jude. Just a couple of pages over. It's that little bitty book in front of Revelation. I want you to understand Peter is not the only one who has a a healthy opinion of, of false teachers. Look at Jude. Look at um, verse number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Doesn't that sound like Peter? They come in privily, come in unawares. Who before of, of old ordained to this condemnation. Notice he calls them ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Very similar to what Peter said. Notice. Um, verse number 8 likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion and speak evil of dignities verse number 10 Um, but these speak evil of those things which they know not that reminds me of verse number 2 there in our text about uh, by reason of the way of truth being evil spoken of they don't know the way of truth they speak evil of it Notice verse number 11, woe unto them. Verse number 12, these are spots in your feasts of charity. Notice uh, verse number 15, actually end of verse 14, behold the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his angels to execute judgment upon all and to convince all, men, all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they ungodly committed of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Those are not, I don't think Jude pulled any punches there. Verse 16, they're murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, there it is again, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Notice, skip down to... um, well, verse 15, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to be your discernment, the word of God. Listen, Peter describes the false teachers. He's not alone. We need to understand who they are. The way we're going to do that is being in the word of God, knowing what thus saith the Lord is. Having described them, then he moves on to their destruction. The first aspect is their description. The second aspect is their destruction. Their pernicious ways, verse 2. And then in the verse 3, to his judgment now of a long time lingereth not. And their damnation slumbereth not. The destruction of the false teachers, they have no hope. Their doom is sealed. The judgment's already been rendered. And the damnation does not slumber. It is coming. And he gives us here three examples. He talks about the damnation, the judgment of the false teachers, and then in the following verses he gives us three examples. In verse number four, he's the example of the fallen angels. God judged rebellion. When the angels rebelled against him and followed Lucifer, the devil, what happened? They were cast out. They were cast out. God judges rebellion and will not spare those who reject his will. If God judged the angels, who were at that time and presently are higher than men, then why would he spare men? The second example in verse number 5 is the old world. And spared not the old world. But saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
the old world. We could turn back to Genesis chapter 6. We won't take time to do that here. But were the believers a majority? No. Matter of fact, the verse tells us how many of them were there. Eight. Eight. The believers were a minority. The message that Noah preached was scorned. He preached it 120 years. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the earth was full of wickedness. Verse 11 and 13, it was full of violence. But understand this. He judged the angels because he judges rebellion, but he also judged the world because he judges those who reject his truth. He judged the, the angels for rejecting his will. He judged the world for rejecting his truth. And then verse 6 and verse 9 were the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. I want you to turn over there. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, verse number 13. For the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord. What's the last word? Exceedingly. Exceedingly. Peter notes in our text, ungodly. Thinking of Sodom and Gomorrah. Ungodly. They were wicked, they were wicked and sinners exceedingly. In the book of Jude, Jude verse number seven. Speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner give themselves over to fornication. And going after strange flesh are set forth for example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Those who talk, say the New Testament doesn't say anything about homosexuality don't know their Bible. Don't know it at all. They say, that was some, oh, that's something Old Testament. That's not New Testament. They haven't read their Bible. Sin is still sin. God is still God. He is still holy. There's they are Fornication and going after strange flesh. In our text, in Second Peter chapter 2, speaking of uh, the same situation, notice he uses the word filthy conversation. And at the end of verse number 8, they're unlawful deeds. Let's just stop and think about something real quick. Their filthy conversation, I mean their filthy manner of living, and it says that Lot vexes righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Okay? A little bit of, let's put our brains to work a minute. Okay? Lot. Lot was the one who lived in Solomon Gomorrah, correct? Okay? Who was Lot's uncle? Abraham. Okay? So you know the time frame we're talking about. Talk about Abraham, those days, Abraham and Lot, their uncle and nephew. The Bible says their unlawful deeds. Who came first, Abraham or Moses? Abraham. So, when Lot was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, did the Ten Commandments exist? Did the law of Moses exist? No. But every scripture says they're unlawful deeds. If the law, speaking of Moses' law, the first five books of the Bible, did not exist yet, then why does the Bible say they're unlawful deeds? Laws of nature. They're unlawful. The laws contrary to nature. You know, it's still a law contrary to nature. People don't like to hear it, but it's still true. There were laws contrary to the laws of nature. They were breaking the laws of nature. Notice verse nine. The application here, end of verse number nine, to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. 
Listen, false teachers may appear to be successful, to be successful, but according to verse number three, they're already condemned. And in verse number three, their damnation is sure. Their place is reserved. They may have a lot in this world. I have a lot to answer for in the next. Some other things I could say, but let's move on to point number three. Deliverance. Deliverance. And I want you to understand something. It's all I can do to hold back not talking about another subject because it goes right hand in hand tonight. I've already brought it up. The Spirit will talk to you if you hadn't already. So three aspects. Description. Destruction. But then deliverance. As he talked about the destruction... In the middle of all the destructions, there was deliverance. <clears throat> Peter denounces the false teacher, but he encourages the true believer. He encourages the true believer. How is that? By giving us examples of deliverance. Noah, verse number five. He spared not the old world, that's underneath the flood, but saved Noah. The eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Notice this. A first example is that of Noah. If we're, if we're really quick, we get to be too quick, we go, oh yeah, he saved him from the flood. That's not the only thing the verse says. He says he saved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Was Noah a preacher of righteousness inside the ark when the flood came? Was he preaching righteousness anymore? No. He, yes, he was saved from the destruction of the world, but there's also he was saved from the pollution of the world. The 120 years that he was preaching, the Lord saved him from the pollution of the world, saved his family from the pollution of the world. His family stayed true. Hey, listen, we live in a dark and wicked time, don't we? There's a promise for us here. We can be saved from the pollution of the world around us. Not only the destruction that is to come. He was, you know, just as Noah was saved, this preacher of righteousness before he was entered into the ark so we can be saved and live pure lives today. You know, just as Noah was surrounded by, by moral and spiritual wickedness, so we are today, but Noah in the midst of that culture was a shining light. Aren't we told to be a light? God can keep that light pure. God enabled him in the midst of corruption to remain pure. Isn't that our Lord's prayer for us? John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verses number 15 through 17. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking here as he's praying to the Father. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Isn't that what he did with Noah? Then continues, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How can it keep us pure in a wicked world? Through his word. Sanctify them, keep them pure, keep them clean. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. So Noah, being the first example, was delivered from the pollution of the world, but then he also was saved from the judgment of the world. So I praise the Lord that he's already promised to keep us safe in the judgment to come. We're going to be raptured out of this place. We're going to be kept saved. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 talks about that coming judgment. It says, but, the, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. There's the big bang. It's at the end of time, not the beginning of time. They got it all backwards. There was a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. There is coming a judgment. It's a judgment of fire, not a flood. So the first example is that of Noah. The second example is that of Lot. Lot. Even though Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, he delivered 
just Lot. Just Lot. If the Bible didn't tell us Lot was a just man, we had no evidence of it, would we? He was a just man. Notice, he vexed his righteous soul, it tells us. He, he was vexed with their filthy conversation. Have you ever stopped and thought about the privileges that Lot wasted? Who was his uncle again? Abraham. And what did, what did God call Abraham? Remember? He's a friend. He was the friend of God. Man, he was Lot with Uncle Abraham. And Abraham was the friend of God. God called him my friend. But Lot wasted that privilege, didn't he? Walking with the friend of God. He wasted that. He traded that for worldly lusts. In Genesis chapter number 13, for sake of time, we won't turn over there, we find that Abraham comes out of Egypt. Verse 5, and Lot also. But then we find Lot and Abraham in just split ways, don't they? And Lot looks and he sees the plains of Sodom and he chooses them, I believe it's verse number 10, because they reminded him of what? End of the verse. As the garden of the Lord liked the land of Egypt. See, he got out of Egypt, but Egypt never got out of him. He judged what he thought was good based on Egypt. Not what God had. And we find, of course, in verse number 12, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He moves closer and closer. We find in chapter 14 that a great war comes. And remember, when that war comes, all these cities are overtaken, including Sodom and Gomorrah. And remember, Lot is taken captive. Now imagine for a moment. Now we, we, we've been blessed living in the United States of America. This has never happened in our generation. But imagine being overtaken and you being taken captive, led out of your own home, out of your own city, and you are now a POW. Let that sink in a minute. What would be your feelings? What would you be thinking about? If you were Lot, and you've been taking POW out of this city that you know is wicked, this city that about to vex his righteous soul, and you're taken out, what would you be thinking? We know the rest of the story. Remember, in chapter 14, somebody gets away and they come to Abraham and tell him what's going on. And Abraham raises up his own servants, 300 plus, and goes to battle against all these kings and wins. He rescues Lot from the POW camp. If you've been rescued from a POW camp, from your uncle who's the friend of God, and God took you out of this wicked city, what would you do? What did Lot do? He went back. Went back to Sodom. Why? Because that's where his treasure was. He treasured Sodom. That's where his heart was. That's where he went back to. But understand this. As you remember that story, and I challenge you, if you get a chance to read Genesis 13 and 14, and pick up on this. Because many Christians, they buy into this fallacy. Oh, but you know what? I can do more good if I live in Sodom. If I can be around them, I can be an influence. Check out that passage. Who had a greater influence on Sodom? Lot, who lived in it, or Abraham, who lived outside of it? Abraham had a greater influence living outside than Lot did living inside. There's a principle there somewhere about separation, I think. It, it might be there. Are you catching it? Lot's treasure was in Sodom because it reminded them of the world, reminded them of Egypt. 
Understand, God knows how to deliver. Notice the verse number 9. For the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. The word knoweth there speaks of God's absolute knowledge. There's no question. There's no, well, let's see, wait and see how it plays out. His absolute full knowledge and knows exactly how to deliver us out of temptation. God knows how to deliver us out of judgment. Therefore, we must prepare for his return. Hey, the Lord's coming back, isn't he? When? <laughs> any time now. We don't know when, but it's any time now. Are we ready? We will be delivered, just like Lot was delivered. But will we be reluctant, like Lot was? Or will we be ready? Lot was spared, wasn't he? When Solomon and Gomorrah were destroyed. Everyone wants to read that story. Didn't he him and haul a whole lot? Well, wait. It's, it's, no, they had to force him out of the city. We're going to be delivered. Listen, don't be duped by false teachers. Don't be duped into false righteousness. Don't be duped into some false gospel. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Amen. Let's